Welcome to the Highway 358 uh, Bible study on Philippians and uh, we just want to reflect this is we're going into chapter 2 today and just reflect back on the last three verses of the last chapter when uh, we were talking about how Paul um, shares how we are to be one in spirit one in mind and in unity and, and, and how we need to be ready for what's to come. And as we move into chapter two, we're going to see that many believe that these next 11 verses are what unity will look like and how we are to build our faith upon those upon these verses. So we're going to crack into chapter chapter two, verse one. And it says there, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any, um, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with, with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. And, you know, verse one really talks about this pillar of un unity. Mm. And, you know, there's four, there, there's four things in this. There, there's we're to be encouraged, have encouragement, to have comfort, to be fellowship in the spirit, and to be tenderness and compassion. Uh, and I, I just find this really uh, encouraging. As I was reading that ver these verses, I was thinking, wow, if we as a, as a believers could grasp the fullness of those pillars, how much different would our, our um, fellowship and that be so nice what, what what do you what are your thoughts on that because it's it's big isn't it four pillars of of real security there uh yeah absolutely but um i think underneath even those pillars is is about the mind of christ that by understanding the mind of christ that's what can bring unity among God's people. So we have to understand the mind of Christ. And obviously this passage, as we proceed into it, um, the mind of Christ is very clear. And that is the basis of uh, unity, is understanding the mind of Christ. Um, and I think from what I understand is that that is what he's, he's given specific examples of, of the mind of Christ, yeah. uh, which is the basis uh, for for our unity. Yeah, and that sort of like when it starts off with if, um, yeah. it's, it's pretty, in the English language, it's pretty, um, it doesn't have the effect, does it, of, of the true meaning of that, that word in the original, really. And, uh, and I think uh, we were discussing this earlier, that since would be probably... Yeah, that's a word. Yeah, that we, you know, since we have, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's uh, it's more. I mean, the word "if" kind of has the suggestion and force of the word "since," but the word "since" seems to be more of an affirming word than "if." Yeah. Um. So if we if we sort of if we sort of exchange that, you know, say therefore. Or since, you know, therefore, since there is any consolation, if since there is any consolation in Christ, you know, since there is comfort of love and fellowship of the spirit and affection and mercy, um, as you say, you know, because we're not, it's not like up for debate, is it? No, no, and that's it, isn't it? You know, mm. it's not like, well, do we have this or not? Yeah. No, of course we do. Um, yeah, and I think and I think that's that that was very key when I was reading these first verses. You know, this isn't about a ch a choice in some ways. It's about your you know you either accept this or you do this. So you can't you know you can't be witnessing if you're not doing what's what it's saying on the on the on, on in that verse really. And you know, 
you know, Romans 12, it talks about being a living sacrifice, doesn't it? And, yeah. and, and I think that's really important to remember that actually that's what we're here for, to be a living sacrifice. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is what discipleship is, isn't it? It's, um, you know, our lives are not our own. And, you know, because we've been bought with a price and, you know, understanding what that means to walk the narrow way, knowing that we will be hated by the world because they, the world hated the, uh, uh, our Lord first. Mm. There will come be persecution. Um, but once we understand that, then, um, you know, we, we are willing to actually live that life, uh, that dying life, so to speak. Um, and I, I think is what brings unity. Yeah. And I think that's what brings our testimony as well, doesn't it? It's, yeah. It's a, it's a testimony of who we are and who we belong to. And, uh, and that's what's more important is, is, is portraying Christ through this. As we were, we were discussing last week, wasn't it? Exactly the same thing. We are, we are representing the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And yeah. He, he's our King. Well, there's a world of difference between a kind of a, a worldly ecumenical seeking after unity because we want to be an example to the world because we've, the church has lost its reputation and its credibility. That's one thing. But actually, once we understand what Christ has already done for us and our union with him, the unity is already there. It's not something we necessarily have to strive for in that sense, because we ha once we understand who we are in Christ and what it means to be in union with him, we have the unity already. Mm. And, it's, and it has to be based on the mind of Christ. Um, so, you know, it's not like a trying to uh, manufacture a unity because it's a good idea because it will look good to the world no. you know and i think that's where you know verse three picks up and it says uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but in yeah humility consider others better than yourselves and you know i th i think god spoke to me a few years ago about this and it's about you know we've got to look at things from his point of view in the sense of that we are meant to be like-minded and we're meant to be um, not about self, but helping others mm. um, and being the servant and having humility and, uh, and all those things. And, and, you know, in a world that we live in, 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 especially in the West, you know, servanthood and humility are not top priorities for most people, are they? And, and, and as we look at this verse, it seems to be, you know, we've got to have our minds set that when we, when we meet together and we disciple together, that we must be like-minded and we must be full of humility. Yes, definitely. Um, but I, I think there's an, there, potentially there's an implication um, behind the word selfishness and conceit that maybe there, these were problems in the Philippian church. Mm -hmm that there was problems of maybe rivalry, division, um, that, that, you know, that, that these were issues that, you know, Paul is trying to address in this church. Um, and, you know, that selfishness and that conceit, I mean, it's, you know, it's amazing when you think of some of the problems that came up in the Corinthian church, um, you know, it's encouraging in one sense because we all fail and we all get it wrong. And we have done throughout church history. The church has got it, you know, as, as Mitz represented the character of God throughout church history. That's why his grace is so uh, unimaginably glorious because he's willing to be misrepresented uh, by fallible, sinful human beings who've been declared righteous because of Christ. Um, but it doesn't, I think it implies that, that there is selfishness and conceit were issues uh, in the Philippian church. And so he's, you know, as an antidote, as the complete an antithesis of that, 
it, it, he's basically presenting the mind of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, when we get to verse four, it says, um, yeah, it goes on to say, each of you should look not only at your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Yeah. Wow. What a yeah. Verse. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think, you know, we've, you know, we've been doing a series, um, and, and it's interesting that we're going through the same series about comparison. Um, and, you know, we, we've been learning, you know, it's not about comparing each other. You know, it's not about comparing callings and things like this. This verse really sticks it to you, doesn't it? With, you know, you've got to, you know, have commitment to others and being, you know, it's like being prepared for the front line of a battleground, isn't it, that's coming up. And, you know, we need to be ready for that. Um, and obviously we're going to go into, you know, when you look at Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, you see, you see this, you know, they're coming armed and ready and uh, prepared with the, with the message. Uh, and with each other, who individually, uh, God is doing things in each of us. If we can just get our eyes off of asking what can, what can God do for us through to what is God asking us to do to bring, out, to bring on others, I think that is the most powerful tool that we in the modern age have got. Um, absolutely. Um, there's a couple of things I want to say in response to that. Um, the first is, again, think of the cultural context, the Roman Empire. Mm. Well, they didn't exactly have humility as an example, did they? No. Um, you know, because they were an all-conquering empire. Humility was not one of their values. Yeah. And so humility um, in the ancient world, in the Roman Empire, it, was, it would have described a slave mindset. It would have been similar to a slave mentality in that culture at the time. Uh, and therefore to be avoided and hated. But actually, you think of the world we live in today, humility is not exactly it's not acknowledged by the world as something to strive for and to aim for is it yeah. um and even in some christian humility can be lacking so actually humility um is very countercultural. and you think of the sermon on the mount blessed are the poor in spirit that's the first beatitude you don't get into the kingdom without being poor in spirit. And that is to have been convicted of your sin, to show your true condition, you know, through the preaching of the law uh, and the true gospel. Uh, and that, you know, before holy God, when the word, when the law is preached and the Holy Spirit convicts us of his sin and his righteousness and judgment, we, are, we realize we're destitute before holy God. Um, and, and that is a crucial sort of first step, if you like, into the kingdom, isn't it? Yeah. But it's countercultural attitude, isn't it? To have lowliness of mind and let each esteem others better than himself. But the second point I wanted to say, Kirk, is we need to have wisdom as well. Because, you know, um, when, when the Lord said, behold, I send you out as uh, sheep amongst wolves, therefore... Be wise first, mm -hmm. as servants, then gentle as doves. Because there will be people that will take advantage. And we can be casting our pearl before swine. Um, it says the righteous uh, chooses his friends carefully. There's a proverb that says the righteous chooses his friends carefully. So um, I think we have to balance it as well, because we're not doormats. No, no. Um, and... Um, you know, we need to have wisdom as well. Compare scripture with scripture. Um, and of course, yes, it's fundamentally a life of humility because of we're, we're following Christ and we're being conformed to his image and his character. But we need to also balance that with wisdom and discernment as well. I just wanted to add that. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and that's something that, you know, all of us have to reflect because we all, we've all come across people who um, absolutely drain us mm. uh, and we're just yeah, exactly. going over the same ground all the time. That's it. It is about, it is about, yeah, the commitment to others is important, but it needs to be the right commitment. And, and I think that's what you're, you're getting at there, the right commitment to, 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 you know, they must have the right commitment as well. So it's yeah. a two way thing, isn't it? Yeah. Now we're coming into the verses from five, five to 11. And wow. Yeah. What, what verses these are? Well, um, yeah. Did you want to describe first five? Yeah, yeah, we can go through that. So, and five says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Well, <laughs> yeah, we, we we've got a lot we've got a lot to do. <laughs> well, in obviously in the natural, um, it's impossible. That's why brokenness is so important. Yeah. Um, because when the cross, we have to surrender to the work of the cross. That as the cross does its work in us. You know, the cross, as somebody once said, the cross is not for wearing or even bearing, but for dying on. Mm. It's not a decoration around your neck. Uh, that's not the cross. It's not for bearing, but it's for dying on. And so, you know, as Bonhoeffer said, when Jesus said, come follow me, he said, come and die. You know? Yeah. Um, so let this mind be in you of being prepared to die and empty this is the kenosis as it's called um the emptying this is where christ empties himself mm. um the emptying uh, i mean it's a phenomenal passage um that we're moving into now i mean it's we're going to going from the heights to the depths um, from humiliation to exaltation it's just phenomenal but our union with him comes into play here as well so do you want to guide us through uh, 6 to 11 Nige um, as best you can yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh, yeah follow that um, yeah so um, yeah so verse 6 who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So, you know, in his pre-existent state, Christ was God. Before he was incarnated, yeah. he was God the Son, the creator of the universe. The Father created the universe through Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. So, um, so verse six speaks of, um, you know, what his pre-existent state, he was in the form of God, mm. you know, and the, the emptying uh, of, you know, his throne in majesty as the sovereign, almighty, holy creator of the cosmos. He empties himself and becomes a bond servant. Mm. there's no words to describe it no like c.s lewis once said in one of his books and it's, it doesn't even come anywhere close that the incarnation was like a man becoming a rat and living in the sewers with the other rats mm. but not even being accepted by the other rats being rejected and killed by the other rats but even that doesn't come anywhere near no. what god did in the incarnation yeah i think in the niv it says it says uh, did not consider equality with god something to be grasped yeah, and, uh, and, and i like that translation of being grasped you know it's like uh, he did not you know it didn't even consider that the equality part did it, it, it just it wasn't something to get he was yeah, I mean, in a way, it's this verse six, you've got divinity and humanity in a, in a sense, um, because it, the first half says being in the form of God, and then it says did not consider it wobbly to be equal with God. 
or something to be grasped. Mm. So does that mean that he's not God? As a, maybe a Jehovah's Witness could use that and say, well, there, there you go, he's not God. Mm. Well, he's the son of God and son of man, isn't he? Yeah. He, you know, he's fully God and fully man. So the first half speaks of his divinity. He was in the form of God before he was incarnated. But then when he was incarnated in his humiliation, yeah. he did not consider it equal uh, as something to, to hold on to uh, and as a, a, a reputation. I mean, he's the creator of the universe. So he's got a bit of a reputation, hasn't he? Yeah, it's a bit. Um, yeah. You know, and, um, and yet he didn't hold on to that reputation and like we like to. Yeah. You know, human beings, when they feel their reputation is, is losing cred, they, they get all bent out of shape. And this is the almighty God. Yeah. And um, the, the humility is, 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 there's no words to describe that kind of humility, the, the humility of God. Um, do you want me to carry on? Yes, please, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then verse seven, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So, as it says um, in, uh, I think it's 2 Timothy 3, when it talks about the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. Mm. He literally became flesh. Um, and so, uh, this section is usually regarded as a hymn, as I said. And verses six to eight uh, speaks of, G of the Lord's humiliation. And then as we move on, verse nine to 11, will speak of his exaltation. So the first section, verse six to eight, um, it kind of progresses from the very heights of the eternal God, the Son, the creator of the universe on his throne, emptying himself in the kenosis of his glory uh, in, and, and his incarnation uh, to take the form of a bondservant. I mean, what a powerful word that is, bondservant. I mean, this is God we're speaking about. This is the creator of the universe becoming, taking the form of a bondservant. Even we don't take the form of a bondservant because we're too proud. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we don't, we, we, we're not, we don't humble ourselves to that extent. So it's, you know, the incarnation is, I think it's one of the things that it should cause us to worship um, because in a sense, he is still incarnated in the body of Christ through us. Um, and it's the ultimate way that he revealed himself because he's the invisible God. No one can see God and live right in his essence. Yeah. And yet, as uh, John Calvin said, that when we look at creation, uh, it's as if the invisible God put on visible attire. And so when we see in the incarnation, we see the ultimate attire yeah. that God put on and clothed himself with, and that is human nature. And bear in mind that when he was glorified and ascended back to the Father, he took our human nature back. Uh, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a glorified human nature, but human flesh still inhabits the Godhead because he intercedes as the God-man. Absolutely. Um, so... But he, the bondservant, not only does he become a bondservant, but the bondservant is actually killed. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's enough to have been, become a bondservant. But then that bondservant actually is obedient to the father, mm -hmm. even to the point of death, and death on a cross. So it's not just any death. No. It's a death on a cross. It's the holy God, the creator of the universe, becoming a servant and dying a horrendous death on a cross. So he, he goes from the very heights to the very lowest. Yeah, absolutely. 
But I think that also speaks, Kev, of our union with him, because in Ephesians 2, we were dead in trespasses and sins, and we were in the depths uh, of our sin and brokenness and alienation from God, and we could do absolutely nothing to save ourselves and redeem ourselves and atone for our sin. And so he comes from the very heights to the very depths, and he basically takes us up to be seated with him in heavenly places from the depths of our sin in a fallen world. Mm. And spiritually, we've gone from being dead in trespasses and sins, and we lived according to the course of this world, according to the spirit who now works in a sum of disobedience. We were by nature children of wrath. And we've gone from the very depths of being dead to being made alive again in union with him in his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and even his exaltation, because we're seated in Christ in heavenly places. And so he emptied himself from the very heights to the very depths to take us up from the very depths mm -hmm. of hopelessness yeah. to the very heights. And that's, that's, that's something to really contemplate on, isn't it? And, and to yeah. re really dwell upon. And I think that that also secures who we are and our identity in him, isn't it? We, we understand who yeah. he is. And that if, we, if we grasp that properly, it's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? It's crucial to um, understand our union with Christ. Mm -hmm. Absolutely essential. Because our three enemies, the world, the flesh and the devil, when we understand union with Christ, Christ has overcome all three of those. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we're in union with the one who has conquered all three. And we live by faith in he who conquered those three enemies that we are constantly up against. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, so now, just one thing about the kenosis, about the emptying, is that you've had a lot of like even in the early church because it was very greek and there was a lot of greek influence in the early church and some people have misinterpreted the christ emptying himself uh, as setting aside his divine prerogatives so um without wanting to get too controversial but um there can be a triumphalism in some charismatic type emphasis where the kenosis means that he emptied himself of being God. And so that we can do the same works as he did as a man. We can do the same miracles as he did as a man because he emptied himself of being God. Uh, and he came to make us like himself. Uh, and, you know, that can lead to, I think, some, a, a bit of an extreme, um, because they've misinterpreted, they've taken, too, taken it too far, stretched it too far, because he didn't empty himself of being God, um, even though he emptied himself of some of the attributes of God as omniscience, um, omnipresent, um, you know, because he was lived in the confines of a human body. So actually, it's an area where, in church history, um, some people can lean toward different extremes. Uh, and, and, you know, that's why the, the Chalcedonian Creed in 451 was so important about the two natures of Christ. Um, yeah. So um, it's an important thing to understand. Yeah. And I think, and I think it's in, you know, this, this is where, um unity is not in place is it because people go off onto one way of thinking and then you get splits and yeah and, and then you end up with a watered down message don't you and you get a, and there's truth in all these things but actually when we come to it if we reflect back on what we've just what we've just read we need to focus on who he is yeah and concentrate on that and have unity in that and come together in that. So there's this, 
there's this piece about as you read through all this is, is there's a piece about his authority being yes. being placed amongst us and it's how we handle that authority isn't it would you say that yeah no that's a good point um because i think it ties in with our union with him that i've just mentioned because we're seated with him in heavenly places um you know because he raised us up together with him mm -hmm. from being dead in trespasses and sins but then what do we do do we then become triumphalist and think that we can just um you know again it's what does it mean that we he we will do greater works than he did well i interpret that as because he was confined in a by a human body when he poured out the holy spirit it meant that the presence of christ could be filled throughout the whole earth mm -hmm. the greater works is not about greater than what he did in his public ministry it's greater in the sense that when he poured out the holy spirit at pentecost that his ministry was able to be completed all over the world so greater in that sense and i know that probably there'll be people that disagree with that but I don't think it means greater in the sense that we can do greater things than he did in his public ministry. When, because otherwise it's like, well, why don't we go and walk on the sea then? Why don't we go and go to the cemeteries and start raising the dead, go to the hospitals and start healing everybody in the hospitals, you know? Um, so the authority, I think, yes, we have his authority because we're seated, but we don't then become proud and triumphalist. Yeah. we become humble yeah and because he, he's done it all that's what this has been all about hasn't it when we look at back at these things it's about humility and and just making sure that we keep ourselves in relationship with an almighty god yeah. who who absolutely loves us to pieces yeah. and he just wants the best for us but we must we we must keep it in check, and uh, and not not dwell too much on ourselves. No, but dwell on the truth of who Christ is. Absolutely. So, as we, if we look at verse nine, so verse six to eight, as I said, is about his humiliation. Um, you know, even the bond servant is obedient even to the point of a. Uh, horrendous death but now in verse 9 we move into his exaltation um, and it's his exaltation um, is in his ascension yeah so this is where um, so in verse 9 it says therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name so that's verse 9 but mm -hmm. the therefore obviously is in context of verse six to eight because of the incarnation, the emptying, mm. uh, the life of humiliation in sense of his earthly life and his humbling, emptying himself, obedient to the point of death and death on a cross. Therefore, yeah. um, God has highly exalted him. So the exaltation um, I mean, this is where Daniel, the famous verse of Daniel 7, verse 13, the messianic verse in Daniel 7, 13, when I saw one like the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, and he came to the ancient of days. Mm -hmm. but, and he was, and a, a, he was given dominion and an everlasting kingdom that lasted forever and ever. So that was the ascension. Um, because he, he ascended after 40 days, didn't he? to yeah. the right hand of the father he passed through the heavens the second heavens through the demonic realm of the second heaven and took captivity captive ascended to the right hand of the father and then his coronation uh in heaven was crowned as king of kings and lord of lords yeah. uh, and psalm 110 verse 1 that god the father is now putting all things under his feet yeah. between the first <coughs> first <coughs> first and second coming um, he is progressively putting all things under his feet, despite appearances to the contrary. So the exaltation is also about his ascension, which we are also in union with. Mm. 
and um, the the that is so that in a sense is the fulfilment also of Daniel seven thirteen. I mean, there's other verses that obviously speak about the fulfillment of, De of Daniel 7.13 in Acts chapter 2 uh, and what have you. Um, so this phase, so it means to be, you know, exalted above everything else in the universe because his name is above every other name. Yeah. And he's called Lord. And the name Lord... Um, is the same as Yahweh in the Old Testament. So he who had been a bond servant is now King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the Lord of the universe. Absolutely. Amen. He who was a bond servant. <laughs> yeah, amen. We've gone, we've gone from bond servant, death on a cross, yeah. to being the King of the universe. Yeah. And we are in union with him. So. Six, six verses there <laughs> that uh, portray the whole message don't they, of, uh, and the whole truth of who Christ is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, we've got to come to an end of this session, but uh, we could never, we were never, ever going to be able to accomplish uh, a really, we could, we could be on this for hours and, <laughs> and ages. Well, and yeah. Ages. Uh, I think, just one more point. It yeah. says at the end of verse 10, it says that every knee should bow of those in heaven, yeah. of those on earth, yeah. and of those under the earth. Yeah. Now, that is literally everyone. That, does, that doesn't miss anybody else. No. That's heaven and earth and hell as well. Mm. Everyone in heaven, earth, and hell will bow the knee and confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord yeah. to the glory of God the Father. Absolutely. So we're coming to the end. Yep. And uh, next, uh, our next uh, week's session, we'll be talking about shining stars. Why? <laughs> so <laughs> that yeah. could be an interesting subject. As I said, we'd really try to give you as much as we can through those six verses, but there's so much more. I, I would I would just recommend you just spend time in prayer and reading these uh, reading these verses and just dwelling on the truth of them because it has the power uh, to and the authority to change lives and uh, so as we finish this session uh, night would you like to pray us out on this session and then we 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 close up yeah. Father, we, you've called us to have the mind of Christ. That when we have the mind of Christ by the power of your Holy Spirit, as you sanctify us by your word and your truth and your grace, that we have unity. And so, Lord, you have made it very clear in this passage that we are to have the mind of Christ himself. And in fact, we do have the mind of Christ as you say in other passages, Lord. And we thank you for the gift of faith um, and that each one has received a measure of faith. Faith in the revelation of Christ, in his incarnation, his life, his sufferings, his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, his glorification and his exaltation. And so, Father, we... We ask that you would use this and by the power of your spirit would sow seeds in as many hearts and minds as you deem fit and bring revelation of what it really means to have the mind of Christ and that we would um, be aligned in our hearts to desire unity because that's where the blessing is and where the anointing is. Uh, but it comes on the basis and the foundation of the mind of Christ. So, Father, work this in us by your Holy Spirit. Amen. To the glory of your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Nigel. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Yeah, thanks, Kev. Thank you.